Hello. Good day for uh, all of us. Uh, uh, this one is also okay. Okay. So friends, uh, uh, this is a good day for uh, all of us. And uh, uh, my friend uh, from USA, Professor Candice Katar, she is here to teach you about the human rights and peace education. And uh, I hope you all will cooperate and you will listen what she wants to tell and uh, his her lecture. And also, you I hope you will participate. Okay, a active participation is needed for the lecture. No need of sitting silently. And uh, I hope all of you will cooperate with her. Thank you very much. I will hand over the mic to the candle. All right, thank you. Can you hear me out there all right? Thank you so much. All right, so um, how should we start? Um, actually, let me give you an overview of the course, just what I ha intend here. You've already seen a, a plan ahead day by day and a schedule that was planned and given with the um, grant proposal and, uh, and the approval of that schedule. And I'm sticking to that for the most part, but I modified it a little bit. Um, so you will see a, a loose alignment with what I'm presenting to you based on my experience and my expertise in this area. And I will share some of um, uh, the content of my books, um, particularly when we get to the second half about peace education. So just letting you know, I'm loosely following that one. I'm including all the content of that plan, but I've tweaked it a little bit. And um, thank you for bringing the resources that we need here. So the overview of the course, I'm going to talk with you, and I think I'm getting an echo. Are you hearing an echo? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk with you uh, about human rights. I have some presentations to make with you, but I want your participation, your ideas, as I said earlier, your perspectives, your knowledge, your awareness. I have very little in this area. I'm, this is my first visit to this part of India. And I, uh, so well, the first part of the course will be about human rights. And we'll talk generally um, today about the major concepts of human rights and it's her history. And then we um, will uh, do a reflection activity today. Um, but then as the week progresses, and we only have one more day this week when we're meeting, right? Um, and I'll go more in depth about human rights and some conflicts that come up, some breaches of human rights, some opportunities for us to respond to those breaches, to think about those breaches, to teach about those breaches. Um, then uh, later on in the course, I will um, share with you just some aspects of how human rights education is to be done, particularly here in India. There's quite a bit that's already been done. And um, then we'll move on and look at how human rights education, as it's been very well laid out um, uh, in many areas of the world, ha maps onto peace education. How do those two components compare as of education? Then I will segue in the next following days into peace education and some aspects of peace education, particularly that I have researched and um, written books about articles and books and shared as a Fulbright scholar in different areas of the world. I think I mentioned earlier, I particularly have worked in conflict zones during um, direct violence and post-violence. Um, so I've had a lot of experience with the healing processes and the um, dealing with um, students who see each other as um, enemies given that their um, areas have just gone through war. Mm. On that topic, I have worked in Israel, I have worked in Ukraine, and I've seen firsthand some of the conflicts that have risen up into direct violence. Um, okay, so that's it. We will work through human rights, human rights education, peace education, applications um, in your mind, in your um, life, in your curriculum, um, and on that note, I want to say that, as I did earlier, education happens in several ways, and I'll elaborate on this later. 
but we have the formal education that we have here in school, in schools of all types, even in preschool, but we have the informal education that we start from the moment we interact with another person. When that baby comes out, how we interact with that baby is an education, and continually throughout that person's life. So education is particularly important in early childhood, but all throughout the rest of our lives. We are educators by our actions, by our thoughts, our words, and especially what we model. So I want you to also think about how you are as an educator in your community, in your home, interacting with people um, everywhere you go in the world, because that is your curriculum too. Some people call it the hidden curriculum. Um, how the school is arranged and what that means is also the hidden curriculum. This is all very educative. And I want you to think about all of that as we go through this. Um, okay, so we're going to start with a brainstorm activity. Um, who does not know what a brainstorm is? Oh, you're all so well-versed, I don't have to teach you then. Okay, so I'm going to start with a brainstorm activity with you, um, which I feel is a good way to start teaching about any concept and, um, or topic, actually. So in brainstorm, you share your ideas and you don't qualify them. You just state what comes to mind. There's no right, there's no wrong, just state what comes to mind. And that's what the storm brings. You don't know what the storm is going to drop, what the wind is going to blow, how the precipitation is going to come out. It just comes. And that's what I want you to do with us now. And I want you to write down. So you're probably ready, I hope so, to take notes throughout the course. And I would like everybody to do this. I would like everybody to um, have a writing utensil ready. And if you want to do it on a computer, you're welcome to do that. I, although I think it'd be easier to do on paper because we're going to be writing in columns. And then we're going to be making symbols next to words. And so, you know, it might, you might get delayed trying to do it on a computer if you have one because trying to find the symbol to put on that word might distract you. Um, so we're going to do a brainstorm activity, and this is what's considered a higher order thinking brainstorm activity. So, I, and when we do it, I don't want any hands raised. It's too slow. I've done this with all ages of students. I think you heard I've worked with children all the way up through adults. And um, it's just too slow to wait for them to raise their hand and call on them. And so I don't want any hands raised during this brainstorm activity. I would like you to just call out what is on your mind when I give you the concept, and say, and one word is good, two words at the most, um, because it just, I just, give us the idea, just give us the word, two words at the most, what your thinking is about that topic. And then we're going to write them on the whiteboard here, and you're going to write them at the same time. And we're going to write them in columns because in the next step after the storm, when we start categorizing, it's easier, particularly for the teacher, professor, whoever, to come up here and find the word when we go through categorization because they'll be spread across here. And um, it's just easier if, we, if you say, oh, in column one, two, or three, or four, that's where the word is. So you'll see how this flows out. So, okay, so, um, I have a scribe. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, he's um, so kindly helping me with this because I may n Oh, I forgot to say, you can give the word in any language. We do not, in a brainstorm, say, oh, this has to be just in this language. And so because you may have some words in Miso or some other language besides English, um, feel free to put the, put the word out there. And he may be better at spelling it than me. Um, if I could spell it at all, because I'm new here. So, okay, so you ready? All right, let's, um, so you start the brainstorm with this question. What comes to your mind when you think of? So if you're wanting to do this later, you might want to write that question down, because that's step one of this brainstorm. What comes to your mind when you think of, and then you give the concept? Okay, so again, don't raise your hands. Call the word out, and he will repeat it back to make sure. Okay, 
all the way in the back? No. Okay. This one's on. Okay. Um, all right, everybody ready? Okay, you have your writing utensils, your paper ready. Great job. So what comes to your mind when you think of human rights? One or two words, okay. Oh, we're gonna microphone, there we go. You want me to use that? No, you have one. Okay, so come on, call out a word. What comes to your mind when you think of human rights? Don't qualify it, just say it. Freedom, is that what I heard? Okay, freedom. freedom. And so, can you repeat them back because I, uh, if you can hear it. Or maybe I should go out here with the yes. mic, no, I'll be too slow with the microphone. Freedom. Okay, what else? Call them out. Equality, equality, right? Good interaction. Keep calling the words out. Everybody. Justice, security. What else? Quality education. Awareness. Equity, right? You're writing them down too. You have to write, you also have to write these words. <laughs> All these words. Because I want you to have a record of this and to see how this is done. So part of my agenda here is pedagogy as well as the topic. Thank you. Okay, what else comes to your mind? Come on, brainstorm. Huh? Empathy. Okay. <laughs> We're just too far apart in a classroom. It'd be easier to hear. And uh, what environment was mentioned there? Huh? Good. Good environment. Okay, we're ready for the next one. Yes. What else comes to your mind? Anything. I cannot hear. Voice. 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 Okay. I'm going to come out here and maybe a bit easier to hear. Okay. What else? What else comes to mind? So solidarity. Solidarity. Human rights. Two word term. Weaker sections. Okay. Who said it? Women empowerment. Women environment. Inclusivity. Em Thank you. Empowerment is being said over here. Empowerment. Empowerment. Oh, women empowerment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, wait. Sorry. Women empowerment. Yes. Oh, you have it up there. Okay. Abuse. Okay. So when the brainstorm slows down, you start using your W words, who, what, when, where, and why. So let's think of who when we think about human rights. Who? Minority. Minority, mm -hmm. Minority. OK. Who else? Marginalized. Marginalized. I think we heard women. Who else? Children. We're doing a great story. Inclusive education. Adult education. Adult education. Civil rights. Okay, what, what, when you think of human rights, what? Protection. Protection. 
constitutional rights. What was the one that was just said? Moral principles, is that right? Moral, Moral principles. principles. Okay. Uh. Religion. Mm -hmm. Violation. Violation. Okay, where? The where's. Human rights and where? Did somebody say everywhere? <laughs> I think so. Poor section. Mm. Education. Education. Society. I think minorities. we have minorities yes, up there. We have. Yeah, you can't see it. He's standing in front of it. Mm. Thank you. War zones. Home. Home. Someone said home. No. Discrimination. 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 What was the last one? Somebody had it. Another word? Civil rights we have? Yes. Courtroom. Mm. Okay, and the last W word would be why. Why human rights? What else comes to mind? Peace, peace, humanity, liberation, why else? Think locally too, globally and locally. Think of your life, your neighborhood. Happiness. Happiness is another word. Do I hear opportunities? Yes. yes. Opportunities. Equal rights. Okay. Equality, but that's okay. Okay. Sustainable development. Think about why India has a commission for human rights, when you think of why. Deprived. Globalization. Okay, one more. Secularism, secularism. Okay, I think we'll stop at that just because we're out of space, not because your minds are empty. I know we could keep going for an hour as we think more deeply about what this all means. Okay, so we have a storm and you have a, the um, words on your sheets. Great, okay. So
crayons or colored markers. And we make one color for each. take a turn. So let's see. Um, I will do globalization in column one, two, three, four, five, and column five near the bottom, globalization. Mm -hmm. And sustainable development, two words above it. In column five, two words above, uh -huh, sustainable development. And um, equity in column one, and women in column two. And I would call my group goals. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So um, I think we'll stop at this because we, you know it take a lot of time to get all of these in groups. But this is what you do in your classroom as an introduction to a topic. And sometimes we finish it all together in the classroom. But um, if we don't, I put the students in groups because it, it shouldn't be an individual activity. Um, to do another day to finish grouping them all, um, or at worst, have them do it by themselves. And the reason for this is, is they're working very deeply with these concepts um, and trying to get the perspective, why, why in the world would somebody put this word in this group? And I notice that we have them all in English, and they don't necessarily have to be, as I said earlier, um, because the more you broaden your language, the more concepts you can get in there. Okay, so we'll stop at this, and um, this is something I wanted to have, not just as a model of pedagogy, but also as a way to see your thinking, to, to see what you're aware of um, as we go on through talking about human rights. Okay, well, thank you. You can leave it. Oh, no, I guess not to show the screen, right? Okay, everybody, so what I'm going to do is um, share with you now one of my two um, presentations that I have today. Yes, everybody has a record, of it, unless you want to take a picture of it. Don't need to. They all have one on their paper, right? <laughs> when I do this in the classroom, again, with colors, I use um, uh, a whiteboard where I can just leave it for a, a while, sometimes even the whole length of the week or month we're studying a topic, and I let the students keep adding to it. As they learn and think about more, more on the topic, they go over there and they keep adding to it. Sometimes I also put white um, paper across the wall, butcher paper, and markers nearby, and they can keep adding to it, and it just gets really beautiful as you see more and more ideas that they have, and it's very inclusive. Okay. Oh, there we go. Bear with me as I'm learning how to use this different computer. I'm a, a Apple Mac user. Can you get me on slideshow? Where is it on here? Oh, here? Click on this? No. This one? Oh, from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Interesting. Okay. So, um, concepts of human rights. We shared some of your concepts, and let's, if we go through this, see some of the concepts that um, I chose to share with you. And most of what I'm sharing with you is what's out there in the discourse, in the literature, in the documentation of organizations, local and global, that use the concept of human rights. So these are concepts of human rights. So first of all, what are humans? What are humans? Anybody answer that? What's a human? I think it'd be helpful to have the microphone. Do you, somebody want to? I think those beetles out there humming away are making it hard for me to hear you, too. I'm enjoying the beetles, though. I'm going to go see what they Hello? look like pretty soon. What's a human? A moral being, those who have so A moral being. Oh, okay. What else? What else is a human? Are humans animals? Uh-huh. Scientifically, we're, we're classified as animals. Mm -hmm. What else? Anything else? What is a human? Social animal, she's saying. Social animals. Mm -hmm. So we have some social behaviors that other animals don't have. And one is morality. Although we know from our science that other animals have codes of behavior. What's allowed in their group and not allowed in their group. Um, 
Okay, so human rights entail moral principles. We're moral creatures, and we have codes for human behavior, just like other animals have codes for behavior within their group. And human rights intends the protection of humans, along with survival. Now, again, these concepts that I'm sharing with you are coming from the literature about human rights and what's typically in documents about human rights and courses about human rights. I want you to share back your thoughts, too, please, as much as possible. Um, so we're, we're animals, but we live by morals and codes for our behavior, and we document those, and we teach those. Um, concepts of human rights, you're going to work with this later today. Um, animal versus human, we are actually animals, but we rank ourselves higher than other animals. And these are dichotomies here. So I don't need to read them to you. You can read them yourselves. Or can you read them in the back? You can see them in the back? OK. All right. So um, and the camera is, um, is the camera pointed at that so they can see it? OK. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to work with these. But these are dichotomies. These are like polarities. And um, you know, it's not just one way or the other way. It's more towards one direction or the, the other pole. And where is the behavior on that continuum? So we think about all of this with human rights. And some of these are uh, terms that you thought of in your concepts that were up on the board. Um, OK. I didn't see, though, elimination and restoration. But um, these are concepts that you had up there. So survival and well-being are major ideas when we think about human rights, um, particularly survival of humans and the well-being of humans. So we have codes for this. So moral principles and codes for human behavior that intend protection of peoples and survival opportunities are the foundations of human rights. And people need those rights to be able to function and thrive for their survival, not only just survive, but thrive in their communities. Um, as we uh, know in Gaza, they were not thriving at all. They were not experiencing their rights. And so um, that's the foundation of the violence that's going on there. A moral principle evident through recordings of HR discourse, writing, speeches, um, the arts is a form of discourse, is the pursuit of peace and um, the interaction of people around the world has been a goal, um, a goal of peace, to, to treat each other well enough to survive in peace, as you, um, your vice chancellor also said earlier. That's just critically important um, and an aspect of human rights. So whose rights are constrained, right? Who, who has rights and who doesn't have rights? Those were on your brainstorm, the concepts. And you had quite a few identities there of people whose rights are constrained. So you're very well aware. You're, please come in. Um, and so the rights of humans, regardless of their identification categories, and I listed some but not all here, and um, everybody's. Human rights is an inclusive concept. It means every human being, no matter how human they are considered by some people, Everybody has those rights. And I'm sorry to say that, but there are some people who are just not treated as humans. We have a lot of research on people with disabilities who have not been given their rights, not been given their rights in medicine, not been given their rights in, in education, if they even get to education. Interestingly enough, Maria Montessori recognized that when she went to give up her son Mario um, to uh, alternative care as a single mother and, and a physician, a brain researcher and physician. She um, w went into the warehouses of Rome and saw that they were full of disabled people and orphans. Um, and they had no system of education, no preparation for society, no formal education at all. So she went in there and said, this is my work. This is where I need to be. I wrote her first book, The Absorbent Mind, and, and noticed how everybody can learn. And so um, anyway, 
everybody deserves these rights, and rights to education is just one that's identified among many others. So what identification status in your community have been constraints to the real realization of human rights? Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, what identification identity in your community, in Mizoram, has been a constraint to experiencing full rights? Take about two or three minutes to tell your neighbor. It doesn't have to be somebody next to you, behind or in front of you. Please, who has had their rights constrained? Okay, hold up your fingers to show me how many different types of people you have identified. One, two, three. Hold your hand up and show me how many people, different categories of people, you have identified in Mizoram is not fully experiencing their rights. Oh. Just one? Okay. Could you share? Would you mind sharing? The disabled, mm -hmm. mentally or physically or both? Everything, okay, all right. How about, are there, um, do we have any unsheltered people, homeless people at all anywhere that can't get to school? Can't get into school? Mm-hmm, we do. Okay, and then we have some people who have identity categories that are not um, given their full education opportunities in school. So we have, if I'm hearing at least three different categories of people whose rights need to be addressed based on their identities. Okay, how has the curriculum you've experienced in whatever majors you've been. I think that you have studied something else besides education, but regardless, just even in education, how has the curriculum you've experienced included issues of identification and human rights? In which class, in which classes, in which courses has the topic of the rights to education, equal rights to education, Adaptations of education for those particular types of people with certain identities. In which courses have you run into that? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your answer. I don't know your courses. I haven't been able to see your list of what you study, so I don't. Law, ma'am. In law? Education law? Mm, okay. General law. Okay. Do courses. Be at courses. Yeah. Oh, inclusive education. In which course is that? Is that the title of the course? Or a, a topic? Special education. What are the courses? Is, even if they didn't call it rights, the idea of human rights is presented in that course, even if they didn't call it rights, that everybody should be able to get an equal education. Do you, now, in the United States, we have um, whole courses in what we call multicultural education and diversity education. Although we have a political trend going on in our country, particularly with 
um, presidential hopefuls, candidates, who are eliminating those courses and saying they're too dangerous. We can't talk about being inclusive. And we can't talk about identity differences. So we have a big conflict that's growing there. For instance, the um, state that I used to teach in, Florida, for 15, 17 years in a university in teacher education and then I, in a conflict and peace program that I developed across five colleges. We talked about diversity all the time and um, different kinds of identities and diversities and how we can facilitate um, equality and equal opportunity as for learning and learning about those identities and learn and being with people of, the, of those identities. But those courses are now being eliminated in Florida by Governor Ron DeSantis, who said, no, 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 no. You can't even bring up that topic or you'll lose your job. And so teachers are afraid to bring it up. And my peace and conflict program that I started there wouldn't have lasted. I left there six years ago um, because I was invited to work somewhere else. And, um, and it was a very interesting opportunity, so I took it. But I'm glad I got out because, um, well, I'm sort of glad I got out for the sake of having a job. But the other sad thing is that I'm very, very concerned about teacher education students who are not allowed to even bring this up in a course. Okay, so this is critically important, and if it's not in the curriculum, if it's not clear in the curriculum, it's not going to happen. It needs to be clear in your curriculum. So one of the emphasis I want to make here is that your curriculum, as I said earlier, is what you formally teach, but it's also in your discourse, in your communication, in your lifestyle, in your interaction with young children to adults. That's your curriculum. And if it's not clear in your curriculum that human rights is important and something that is a goal for everyone, it's not being done. Okay, identification of negative rights. So we have these categories, negative and positive, and um, <laughs> social scientists use them, taking them from um, other scientists. So we have negative and positive. Negative is the interference or non-harm. So I um, have the right to not be enslaved. And I actually was almost enslaved once. It was very, very interesting. It was quite scary, too, to find out that I was almost trafficked as a college student, how easy that can happen. Um, so that's a negative right, the right to not be enslaved. And um, and a positive right would be something like having um, access to education, as we're talking about. People of all identities need access to education. So some people talk about negative and positive in the discourses of human rights, and that may be something that's useful to you as you're thinking about your curriculum. Because the more the brain uses positive concepts, the more people apply them. The more we use negative concepts, the more we experience them. And think about that. So as you think about how to present an idea, present it as much as possible as positive. We are going to do this instead of we're not going to do that. Because you know what the brain does? It doesn't process not. It pictures what you said, and it doesn't process not. So pro try as best you can to process and think the positive. So negative and positive rights. We want to talk about positive rights as much as possible. Where's the place for negative rights? In the courtroom. When it gets so bad that it has to go to litigation in a courtroom to protect somebody or an organization, that's where it belongs, in the courtroom. OK, the origins of modern human rights. Again, I'm from the West. And most of my um, training and experience with human rights is, is from there. So I was just reaching out to see, OK, what else in antiquity um, up into modern times have been um, rationale for human rights in this part of the world as well as others. And um, so concepts of peace across spiritualities, across religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism, 
have been present throughout time. They may not have called it human rights, but this is not a new concept. This has been going on for a long time, and I'm very encouraged about that. Um, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, the Bhagavad Gita, they're all express humanitarianism. It's been there for a long, long time. Humans have been thinking about this. You know, in war and violence and attacking each other is not that long in human history. These are longer humanitarianism. And that's a tradition we need to keep in the front of our mind. So what are examples of spiritual concepts and their sources that express human caring? All right, I want you to write one down on the other side of your paper. What is at least one spiritual concept in any religion, any spirituality, that you know of that expresses human caring? One concept. Write it down, please. Could be from Christianity, could be from a cultural norm, rule, lesson, a spiritual concept about human caring. You're welcome to write more than one. Okay, so here's one that um, the code of Yurnamu in Mesopotamia was written on tablets in the Sumerian language during 21 to 2050 BC. One rule was compensation to the victim for damages from mental or physical injury, as well as loss of property. Pain, suffering, and emotional distress were categories of loss to well-being. Here's a concept, ancient concept. No pain, no suffering, no distress. That's caring. The Code of Hammurabi was written in Old Babylonia on basalt. 1755 to 1550 BC, its top depicts the leader of Babylonia with Shamash, the Babylonian sun god and god of justice. Sun worship and across cultures and time worldwide reflected the influence of the deity on humans. The Code of Hammurabi contained rules for the rights of men, women, children, and slaves. These are just examples from antiquity. But this is not new. Ancient Egypt promoted the rights of individuals and suppressed imprisonment for debt. As an intermediary between humans and deities, the pharaoh was responsible for facilitation of impartial justice. Pharaoh Bokaris, who ruled during 725 to 720 BC, for example, had been credited with prevention of slavery for debt. In the Archimedes Persian Empire of the 6th century BC, Cyrus the Great had precursors to modern human rights inscribed. These included the right to practice one's faith without persecution and forced conversion, which was especially important to the Jews who had been in Babylonian captivity prior to Cyrus's conquest of Neo-Babylonian Empire. A foundation of human rights was evident in the reform of Arab society that Muhammad advocated. In the Constitution of Medina that he negotiated in 622, the rights of the Muslims, Jews, and other populations of the region were addressed as one community, or Ummah. Muhammad advocated for the increased rights of women and ethnic minorities while he condemned female infanticide. Early Islamic laws for military conduct reflected tolerance for diversity with the rule that prisoners must be treated equally with shelter, food, clothing, regardless of their cultural identity. Are we doing that today? In the Kingdom of Poland, the Statue of Calais initiated in 1264 that constituted the General Charter of the Jewish Rights designated their protection in Western Europe, where they'd been experienced persecution. It signified religious toleration while it allowed Jews to trade as free men rather than remain as serfs. Among other protective clauses, this statute designated that Jews would also be allowed to shop for food. What a right. 
Okay, those are just some examples from um, keep track of time here. Is it 12.15? I don't have a clock, so. Is it 12.15? Yes, okay. So I think, um, let's see, does this go out quickly? Again, I'm learning your, oh, yeah, it does. Trying to scroll down here. All right, let me just use the arrow. There we go. So we won't read the whole pro preamble, but as you can see through it, that um, it's, it's uh, and is this highlighting here? Not very well, okay. Oh, it's not showing. Okay, I'm gonna skip this um, because of time. And I hope I can get out of this without losing everything. Again, thank you for your patience. Um, nope. Okay, I'm on my. <laughs> it's not showing. I don't know why. Okay, we'll work with that later. Just get me back to my. Oh, interesting. You can see it, but it doesn't show on the computer here. There we go. All right. All right, so scopes of human rights. So these are um, the whole life of a person and um, okay, and then I'll just stop at that. It's through the whole life of a person from childhood or adulthood um, and we have codes that cover that. And classifications of human rights, these are classifications that um, the United Nations came up with when they wrote their first global human rights policies. So civil, political, economic, social, cultural, and development-oriented rights. Some of these became laws, and some of them are what we called soft laws. They're not enforceable in courts, but they're held up as standards. And okay, so I'll stop there, and I think we need a break. So let's take 10 minutes, okay? Let's get up and take a break for 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs>